Hey, what's going on, roleplayers? It's the Bard here, and welcome back to the corner. So today's video is a little bit different. I would love to sit down and talk with you about necromancers. I feel we would have ideas to go back and forward. While I do love a good chat about necromancy, but more so I just enjoy a good chat full stop. So, it seems like as good a time as any to start chatting with people on the channel. So, first of all, I should thank you for coming on to the channel. So it's, uh, That's right. It's nice to meet you. I read one of your comments. It said that you wanted to have a sit down and talk to me about uh, your chosen topic. Well, here's your opportunity. Well, I already asked this, but I say for people who don't know, how did you get into necromancy? I actually, <laughs> you're gonna want to know more about it again. So, yeah, we've already we already asked this question last night in a trial run. But yes, I did find that necromancy is one of those schools that I think has a lot of scope. I think it also has a lot of potential in character development. I look at uh, necromancy and think there are, must be many ways in which a practitioner would want to get into this. Um, some of the simplest perhaps being they just have an aptitude for it. Um, some of the more evilly inclined might just see it as a pathway to power. But the more, um, should we say, I think the more character-driven reason a, a person would get into that particular school is because they they want some kind of um, some kind of power when it comes to uh, bringing something back. You know, and it always ends in tragedy because the only thing that will ever truly bring something or someone back to life is divine magic. And I think people who or think that characters that don't have access to that follow the necromantic route in order to try to get some semblance of that. But again, like it always ends in tragedy for that character. But it's it's the journey there, it's the journey of discovery that's that is the main story. It's so. a power of friendship, guys. <laughs> you could you could argue that point, but the same thing, you know, it's uh, it doesn't have to be. It could just be a loss that you've had before. Um, your adventuring starts. So, I mean, it might not even be uh, friendship. Perhaps your um, your uh, magical master has died unexpectedly, and he still has so much more necessary to teach you. So you want to bring him back because he's still got a job to do in helping you fulfill your destiny. Hmm, interesting. <clears throat> but then again, I suppose in a roundabout way, if you ever actually ever achieved that you would have probably have learned everything that he had to teach. So it's a very interesting spiral of, um, you know, or a very interesting circle of uh, of, uh, of logic when it comes to a character's development. See, the thing that actually makes me laugh by what you said last is that uh, you said you really like the clear rowing titan necromancers. Like, speak with the dead, um, master of the mind, stuff like that. I always think that Speak with the Dead is something that perhaps every necromancer should have available. I think it's a little bit silly that arcane casters can't cast it. Um, there's actually a reason being, in my I would say, opinion, but I don't know if it's fact or not, so I guess you could say a bias opinion, but for what I was saying earlier, I would just speak with it as a... You said you can learn more from Master, and that's where you go down to Roosh, mm -hmm. but if you have Speak with the Dead, you can talk with him and get more information needed by him. Hell, even in the future, he can actually make him more wise uh, going by past tragedies. That's true, yeah. So why, why what's your uh, opinion or what's your um, knowledge then why Arcane Casters don't get to speak with dead? Uh, because, well, I'm not saying that necromancy is evil because I cold-heartedly disagree with the whole necromancy is solely evil, only evil characters can use and is only evil magic with evil purposes. Yeah? I have, I, yeah, I'd agree. It's, um, it's, it's not, a tool isn't evil, it's the person using it. Exactly, my man. So, <clears throat> with necromancy, it's... For the way I look at it, it's someone who doesn't want death to occur... But it's not to stop the inevitability of that either. It's someone who can accept the dead, dead happening, but wants to, I guess, somewhat cherish 
the idea of life. So that's what they do to bring, I guess, the skeletons and zombies back from the dead. You know, it's not Cleric or Paladin who can use true resurrection, you know. Mm. But with Necromancers, they go into that dark power. And also, it's, the whole thing with, that, with going to the dark room is, let's say if you had a very high upbringing, you were a very positive child, right? Right. But, and then out of nowhere, you, you pull a Batman on it. You took, your par- two parents died, you know, your ba- best friend, you know, stabbed you, your girlfriend slapped you, whatever the hell that happened, <laughs> you, know? Right. you know what I mean? Something yeah. bad happens to you. You're still going to want to do the good things, but you're not going to do do in a good way. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. No. It's, an anti, it's an anti-hero mentality, I think. Well, the thing is, um, I think from a, a purely story standpoint, people look at death as the, the, the end thing uh, for all people. And when um, characters are able to raise skeletons, raise these uh, mockeries of life, that's why it becomes seen as perverse. And thus, um, whatever other thing the necromancer does, by extension, they always have that that tar on them, if you know what I mean. They'll always have that label attached to them. Going back to what you said earlier about it's how... Good. Going back to what you said earlier about how um, it's not evil in and of itself, it's just what people do with it so i think that's um part of the problem yeah because i even in people in real life i talk to it's always like the necromancer is evil and you're a necromancer yeah but i have not done anything evil yet yeah i've only killed in self-defense or to protect someone you're a necromancer (laughs) yeah true the irony of course though is um no one thinks that way about the cleric no, no one. And no, no. It's like he's died, and it's like, well, I, I brought him back to life, and it's like, yeah, but he's dead. That's the circle oh, of life, and and you've just broken a- that. <laughs> I was actually going to bring that up, and all. No, thank you for bringing it up for me, because the thing is, though, with clerics, they don't. They actually force this with higher level spells, the unwilling spells. Yeah, they they actually force the soul back into the body. When necromancers, we're using the physical body. There's no soul being harmed. No, I mean the soul's already been allowed to depart. It's gone on to another yeah. plane. It's 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 gone to its final rest. It's just the body that's animate, and it's not even alive. So it's just an object that that's moving. Whereas with clerics, and they are bringing, they're forcefully bringing the soul back. They they could be bringing the soul back from paradise for all they know. And they, yeah. they put, they, they're forcing it back into the body and making them live again. I mean, there are some, um, there are some, um, like, stories which uh, theorize that, oh, it's like, um, there are some stories that suggest that the, the people who've been brought back, they suffer extreme emotional pain because they've seen paradise and had it stripped away from them. Oh. That's sad. It can. Take, I, I, I expect it. I expect it take, is. <laughs> take that. Take that. Take that. Sixty twelve psychic damage. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Damn. Like you'll actually laugh because I have a character my who's my main character in Dungeons and Dragons right now who is a cleric. Yeah. But he used to be a wizard necromancer. A bullywog, actually. Uh huh. With frog people. Well, I say frog people, they are frogs. But um, a wizard necromancer who worshipped Baal, the uh, god of murder, I assume you know who that is. Uh Uh-huh. So a little boon I got, homebrew one, was called Baal's Banishment, yeah? Right, okay. It it, it basically hurls you through hell for an hour and puts you back to where you are. it's It's a kind of dimension door, you know what I mean? Yeah, that sounds pretty nasty. Mm. So, <laughs> my character's level 8 right now. Uh, what I did was I bought his banishment and I wanted to change my form from a bullywug. <laughs> right. Because it was fun for the first 8 levels, but <laughs> it's a bullywug. <laughs> but, so I'm like the third person to do it. Anyway, so 
I did that, and I asked him to make make me his champion. Right. He says later on, so basically when I'm higher level. Uh huh. And uh, I also asked him to give me new strength. And um, the one thing about my Bullywood Wizard Necromancer was a secondary boon I got was the ability of Maromancy. Do you know what that is? It doesn't sound familiar. Bone magic. Oh, okay. The ability to manipulate bones. That's more of the aspect my character's at now, just because, to be honest, 5th edition didn't give many necromancy options, to be honest. We've but, lost um, a lot. We've lost a lot in 5th edition. I, I keep going back to 3rd and uh, to, to be inspired, but I think uh, there are a lot of things that necromancy's lacking nowadays. But uh, yeah. that's not no, no. tangent. Carry on with your... your... No, no. No, 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 you're fine, you're fine. I was going to say, you're my economy of scrub for this, but I've actually never played 3rd uh, edition yet. Oh, you're missing out. It's very, yeah. very good. Well, I actually might give it a bash on this one. I'd highly recommend it, and I've got some very good um, uh, books uh, for your recommended list. So, uh, as you can tell, I like anything you know, goth book. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, just to put it bluntly. But um, my romance, I have the ability of bone daggers, uh, bone spear, bone shield. To explain all this briefly, is um, I have a companion. Got name Masashio. Yeah. And he's a life, he's an undead life skeleton. Like right. he's life and sentient, but he's like loyal to me. Oh, I see, yeah. Funny enough, he has most goal out of our entire team, but anyway. Anyway, so my ability is let's say I use bone daggers. His, his rib cage plops open and dagger shoots out. <laughs> wow. Stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I hurled myself to hell, and I am now a dark tifling cleric maromancer. Okay. Uh, well, with the domain is what's interesting about him, and I feel like you'd like this. Do you ever hear of the undeath domain? Not the death domain, the undeath domain. Um, for third or for fifth? I think it's Hornbrew, to be honest. Uh, no, I think uh, there's... There's an undeath domain in third for sure, um, hmm. and there's a, also a death domain in in third, and then you've got um, you've got like the uh, clerical, you've got the a similar version which is I think it's the grave domain. Yeah, but uh, sadly that's more about fighting against the undead more than actually using the undead. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, well, you know, tell me about it anyway. I know. So. This one is it's more so your... Uh, actually, you know what? The best way to put it is one. Once per day, at the start of the day, you can raise an undead creature CR level to your level divided by four. Okay. What, the hell, what the hell does that mean? Basically, for people at home, I'm level eight and I can raise a CR of one. If it's your, if it's your level... Yeah, divided by four. Is that it? It's your level divided by four. So your cleric level or your character level? Your character level. Okay, so you'll get um that'll allow you then to summon a, a CR two um CR2. undead. Yeah, Sorry, you're right. CR two, so I can get a shade. Yeah. Nice. So um yes, I at the start of the day you can raise up an undead like a shade or you know later on you can you can actually get mummy lords now that I think about it well not a mummy lord but a mummy which then can raise his own stuff mm. but and his whole thing is making that better you know your this damage is added to your wisdom modifier added by your wisdom modifier sorry I see so it's, it's uh, essentially a summon it's a summon your cantrip damage is also increases by your um, wisdom modifier. Yep. At a higher level, you get get more bonuses basically with that one summon. But what's interesting is that with the Mar, sorry, actually not going to go on the Mars I said the whole thing with the cleric. The whole thing is uh, I've changed the cleric, and no one has called me evil once yet. No. Well, then how? Am be evil. My character's going to turn evil, but no one has called me evil yet. But 
I mean, are we talking about no one's t- called your character evil in your party? Or, I mean, how much interaction has, has your party had when it comes to the common folk? How much uh, directly do you um, pr- perform your your feats in front of them? Every chance I, get, I use more necromancy than I do healing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so... But I mean, are we are we talking about the the masses, the people, you know, the the common folk? Are you using your 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 powers and <laughs> them all the time? Uh, no, because uh, my uh, DM has a, the towns are not too keen on necromancy. To be fair, so my little buddy Masashio has uh, this guy self. Ah, yeah, that's well. There you go. You see, um, no one's going to call you evil because nobody knows. Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty, yeah. pretty straightforward. Uh, it seems. It seems, yeah. Until you realize, until you realize, outside of that town, fifty other people saw me use necromancy. Ah, well. Now that's an interesting conflict then, because you've got a town that that knows no different. Perhaps it's um, you, you know, perhaps you've befriended the guards in there, but on the outside, there are the people that are like burn the witch, burn the necromancer. But so it's again, it's an interesting setup. That town is fine with us, but we robbed our arcane bank anyway. But then on, <laughs> oh yeah, so, <laughs> just I'm 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 going to become evil. He says, but I'm not evil yet. But I'm still robbing banks, you know. <laughs> our, entire, our, our entire team robbed the bank, but uh, you know, <laughs> we're, we're not bad people. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I can I can just imagine that holding up in court. Uh, yeah, uh, it's like, yeah, I robbed it, right? <laughs> but, but but we're not bad people. <laughs> well, I actually, well, I should tell you why the c- civilians cannot be angry at us. <laughs> yeah, tell me why I can't be blamed for this. <laughs> go on, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's an arcane um, bank, right? So it's magic items primarily, right? Uh huh. If we rob items, it's a video <laughs> claim. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you take them from the from the magically rich and give them to the magically poor? Is that your justification? We did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. We we were basically in, we were basically a mini Robin Hood, I feel like, <laughs> or <a> greedier. <laughs> you never have a problem with Robin Hood, do you? Oh no, ten out of ten. That guy. I mean, he, I'm sure he. Uh... I'm sure everything he did was totally justified. Uh, if it's if he's ten out of ten, give us seven out of ten. Because <laughs> we're close, baby. All right, all right. So, Car- 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 Carol, tell me more about this uh, this magical bank. Oh, you want to hear about it? Okay, let's go. Oh yeah, tell me. Okay, so also my my friend, he is a master strategist. Oh my god, you just heard us right. Now, fair enough, he had a month to uh, plan it, but still as an arcane bank with a lot of security. It's going to be hard to break in. Yep, sounds to reason. So, just to give you a rundown of the characters and what items they have... No, I should, give, I should break them into the bank first to make it more detailed, right? Mm-hmm. So, you walk in the door, right, of the bank. Yep. What you see is, is a giant statue. And the statue, when you walk in, will look at you look at you, and when you walk, I'll keep looking at you. Uh-huh. You know, standard stuff. And it, it looks like just a generic bank. It, has, it goes as uh, stairs going up, upwards in the corners, you know, those giant, fancy corner stairs. Well, there were, there's ones that um, arc up around the sides. Yeah. yeah. The other ones, I have to go up, as, not, not a circle, but like a small uh, side circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then there's um, downstairs also. So that I'll give you a, that's a brief description you need to know so far. Mm-hmm. For the characters, you need to know this. We had the guy who was going in there talking, the changeling shadow mancer. All right, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he had what. We, with him a briefcase owned by our teammate. Right. This briefcase is a portal to a dimension. So you open the briefcase, you go down the ladder, you're in a different dimension, right? Okay, interesting. Okay. Now, we already 
me and a teammate of mine, we already scoped out the place. So we got fine detail. That's how we were able to make up this plan. But for now, we're in... It was the Shadowmancer, Changeling. Me, the... Um, I was a cleric. Yeah, I was a cleric Maromancer. The... He keeps changing his characters. Which one was he at the time? He had two. It was a uh, like human or mech forged rogue. It was a rogue anyway. Rogue, right? <laughs> yep. And the Shadow Mancer is also part rogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. <clears throat> um, we also had a a cleric warforge. Sorry, not warforge, war master. You know the guys who really like smithing a lot. Yeah chanting their armor and stuff yeah them and uh, and a few companions just to speed up the process <laughs> because trying to remember like seven different characters is really annoying yeah I but imagine especially when they keep changing every two sessions literally our DM said this is the final change stop <laughs> so all of us in the briefcase, the changing shadow master who changed into a Goliath. Yeah. All right. So he changed into a Goliath wearing a fancy suit. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he walks in. He's looking impatient, right? Very, very impatient. And he goes up to um, the arcane dis- uh, depo- uh, depository, like where the window is. Yep. And he goes up to the person. All right, I'm here to. I'm here to check out your security system, test it out. Okay. Yeah, I'm here to test out your security systems. And he's like, um, "Okay, let me check if we were notified or anything." And again, looking impatient, impatient, impatient. He comes back where obviously we were notified. We have no record of of a security drill. And he goes, look, I don't know. That's on their end. I'm just here to do my job. All right? Mm-hmm. And because I don't know... Oh, yeah, no, I know why. Because he had a plus uh, charisma score of six, and he's really good at talking and deceiving, he got away with it. Ah, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Yeah, very good. Uh, so he goes downstairs, and there's four guards. Right? And you. they ask him, what are they doing here? Uh, like security drill is like okay we'll be here uh, will you do that no it has to be the worst case scenario I have to know if your security is working either be incapacitated or leave your choice obviously they they, uh, they leave now here's the plan we have two guys who are very good at locks lock uh, picking the rogue yep. the two folks there is two walls 20 volts each. Okay, yeah, yeah. This outside of the main depository, by the way. We have an hour to do this. In-game, an hour. So it took him a half an hour to break all the locks outside. Mm-hmm. While another character was spending a half an hour trying to pry open the door. Okay. <laughs> and the door is like solid steel. looks like a wall underneath his bars. This is like an ooze who's using all acidic to try to burn through and stuff. So, out of the 40 vaults, they were managed to open 30 of them, which is massive. That's good. That That's that's 30 items right there. That's good. So, half hour goes by, they open the vaults, the door opens, and we're still not going to run and grab everything because we're not stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the strategist, he flips a coin. It thinks, none happens. Okay, we all run in one each, and we grab one item, run back into the uh, briefcase, right? Right. I go in, grab something, everyone grabs something, until there's three left, right? Yeah, yeah. The floor starts opening. The floor starts opening from one end to another, slowly coming out. And what you hear in this is, tink, 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 
ting, 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 until you see what looked to be a black pit into nothingness, a giant robotic spider. Oh, okay. This is after most of the team jumped back into the briefcase with all the, comp- all the companions. So there's three of them, and they looked at it, and I thought, oh, sh- wow, do they have to fight that? Nope, they bolted out of there, hit the button, and flopped the door. <laughs> Sounds like the best way. Mm, everyone's back in the briefcase. It's a glide, unscathed, cleaned up. He walks up with a smirk on his face. I knew you were all incompetent, Morris. You've already been robbed. <laughs> Very good. So, they were like, wait, what? So he walks away, and standing in front of the door is the uh, manager. Okay. So he takes a turn up the stairs, and the manager says, report back to me when you're done. And the guy gave him a nod of, yeah, of course. <laughs> He goes up behind a pillar, shadow steps into a random alleyway. And that's the heist, yeah? No. They were at the end of the heist, but it's not over quite yet. Okay. Tell me more. We see a homeless man. (laughs) Right. Or or should should I say the homeless man saw saw him. And he went up to the homeless man and gave him 50 gold and just said, get yourself something to eat, nice place to stay. And he nod him like, you know, now. So the homeless man goes away. <sighs> the guy doesn't take three steps before the homeless man is back with two of the guards. Right. We've we've been hearing a lot of, because sh- he also used shadow uh, step beforehand in the city. We've been hearing a bit of shadow magic or wear type of magic. And also, you came out of nowhere. Here's the thing, though. He also said, also, why were you giving this man 50 gold? Because they were searching for a bank robbery. They were searching for the glass. But he didn't know. Because he didn't know, he's a changeling. <laughs> he went back to his... Sorry, he wasn't a guy. He went back to his original form, sorry. Mm. I flipped the story there. After he shadow-stepped, he went back into his original form. Okay. But it was, but it was still weird because he came out in order to the homeless man. That's why he brought back the two guards. Ah. Just, just a speed acting backup. So they're looking at the changeling who's in his purest form. And they're like, why'd you give this homeless man 50 quid as, like, shush money? He looked straight at him and said, because I remember what's like li- living on the streets. Looks down at his suit, just, you know, does a, no collar, you just do it's a tug on it. <laughs> You know, I only got this far because a random stranger gave me a bit of help. So I can become this successful. I was only trying to be that nice to a random person myself. You know, if you're going to, you know, do this, can I at least have the 50 gold so I at least know I can give it to someone who's nice and not scum like you? <laughs> and they were like, for the word magic, and for under suspect, you are under to pay 150 gold. Right? And he smirks, grabs 100 gold out of his pocket. Sure, I have enough. Walking away, he sprinkles one by one on the floor. <laughs> Walking away. Without even looking back, just says, No, gather that money on the floor on your knees and hands like the filthy wear. So he, uh, changed into a, another race. I can't even remember what race at this point. But he was climbing through roofs, running through alleyways, getting away. Yeah, yeah. People saw him. Okay, yeah. So now, he's back to a changeling. He went under the sewers. And here's the moral of the story. After the sewers, he, he talked to what basically the thieves guild of the city. Yeah. And they said, we'll throw in a few rumors. So now what people think is, a Goliath did it, a Changeling did it, a human did it, a this did it. All those races live in the city. 
Ah. So in that, it's just wor- who against who, word against word. No one could prove anything. Brilliant. That's, that is a very good strategy, I have to admit. Like, pretending you're in the security, already make it look like they already got robbed. Like, to be fair, I wouldn't think of that one anyway. Good, good. Impressive stuff. So, tell me uh, tell me more about your necromantic theories. Because that, that was a nice side. side yeah, I, I, I enjoyed that story. Yeah. I'm glad, actually. I'm glad you did. I didn't tell it the best. There were some better bits I could add it, but I'm glad you enjoyed what I told. No, I think people got the general gist of it, or will do. So, with necromancy, the one thing you said that actually struck me as interesting is that uh, you were talking a lot about the curses of necromancy. Yeah, I think the curses are some of the more more important aspects that tend to get overlooked because people like to people tend to think of necromancers in terms of raising undead my minions yeah um the curses on the other hand uh because many necromantic curses do uh are well they 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 hinge so primarily on the channeling of negative energy to uh direct parts of the body which therefore cause a curse effect or you know a a debilitation of some description and i think it's something that tends to get overlooked yeah um because the way i see it the necromancer should be they should be looking to focus their their efforts into manipulating life now un- understandably a necromancer's talent isn't going to allow them to to grow fruit it's not going to allow them to you know um breathe life into or not true life into into things it's not going to then they'll never grow a, a garden with their power or anything but you know the, the power that they do have the they manipulate um they manipulate life very well at least in the negative uh, aspect and that's probably why um people will have the mis- misconception that nothing good will ever come out of necromancy mm, i don't i actually don't agree with that at all well, like I said, it's it's people's misconception, yeah. but um, I mean, feel free to tell me your your oh, yeah. thoughts. Um, when I was watching um your video, actually, <clears throat> there was one question I asked myself, and I really wanted to ask you. Yeah. yeah. When you were talking about the necromantic curse, don't you see? Uh, don't you find a familiarance in kind of witch doctor curse? Oh, I see what you mean. Um, so. Uh... The, like the curse of bad luck kind of thing. Uh, yeah, the voodoo, of course. Um, again, it, it's it's. I suppose it's something that's possible. It's not something they really delve into in in D and D lore because they have their very set schools of magic. Again, it. I I think the voodoo curse is more. I think it's more as, like the style of divination. When you look at something like portent as a as an ability, you know you're you're twisting fate. For the the voodoo style of curse, yeah, you could have um, if you had like the, a withering effect, that would be like the the necromancy style. But like the curse of bad luck, it's definitely it, it is a twist of fate, and that's usually the uh, the domain of divination. I would say that's the fair answer. Actually, I was not expecting that. That's actually a good answer. Fair enough. Yeah, she learned something. I mean, because uh, every every school is is really specific in what it does. So, like, obviously, you've got necromancy, which I would perceive as you know the the flow of energy in a creature. Whereas there are more powerful things, such as transmutation, conjuration, for example. I think people, I think uh, characters are drawn to necromancy because of the um, because of its. Sp- but, you know, it's specialization in how it affects things that are alive. Yeah. The thing is, uh, so necromancers really can't win this scenario because you've used the curses. You are affecting a living person with defectiveness. If you're using the, uh, res- the reincarnation ability, not the reincarnation, that's putting the soul back, the resurrection abilities, like, you know, animate dead animations, 
you're perceived as putting the soul in the dead body without truly resurrecting them, which is, again, not the case. Right. So necromancers really do have a bad rep, no matter which side you really go with. There's no, and people can't really see a white mage necromancer, even if you build one, doesn't really make a difference. So what strikes me as interesting, no one uses it to curses. No, which, and they should be. And it should be like I, even I actually took the um, curses with um, my cleric. I have Raymond Fieldman and um, what's the one that starts with big and um, bestow curse. No, that's warlock. Um, maybe it was oh, the right. Oh, are you, are you thinking of Bane? Oh, Bane. That's a thank yeah. you. I was on about Bane. I took Raven Fieldman and Bane. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. yeah they, I I really like Raven Fieldman. I like what it does now. Um, what it used to do before was just a strength drop, but now. The way it kind of just halves all the damage, I think, is very interesting. I'm also read the wrong way of them because when I used to read it, read it, I read it as your is a strength manipulator. Yeah. See, that's that's the other interesting thing because my mind goes straight to wizard when I hear necromancer. I know that um, clerics can specialize or have you know they can choose to pray for necromantic spells, and it's very, it's not often that people perceive. Uh, a cleric or someone of divine faith as necromancer even though that is exactly what they are when they are choosing to use those spells or when they are choosing to follow a path that has that I agree with you, I don't care what type of cleric you think you are if you're casting true resurrection you are a necromancer <laughs> I'd have to agree with that one. Oh no I'm putting the soul back in the body yeah unwillingly and it still puts them back alive that is true, but I also think that what people tend to forget is clerics are very, very bound by what they should be able to do because every spell that they get is gifted to them by a deity and the deity has every right to intervene and not allow the cleric to do something and I think that's something that a lot of DMs forget to do because you push the soul back into the body, maybe against its will. If the deity was truly like keeping an eye on things it might refuse this you know this gift or, or it might refuse this act considering it to be potentially be as evil an act as as uh, as raise you know on on par with raising the dead or raising the you know a skeletal army i think that's something that a lot of dms forget to do they they forget to challenge their clerics and and they forget to look at it from the deity's perspective no, I actually agree with you, to be honest with you. Like, also, it also goes with the Paladin, and people forget that too, but with clerics, a lot of people also tend to forget that um, if your god doesn't like you, he will take away your power. So if you mess with that god the wrong oh, yeah. way, you will be powerless. I actually heard stories of clerics fighting their gods, and it never made sense to me because the god can take away your power. I know it, it makes zero sense. You would think. I think perhaps with in those instances, they, an, another deity might see them as a potential champion and then gift them their their powers. And and so they they think that they're retaining their their gifts, but someone else has, has given it to them in in response because obviously gods have conflicts the way that people have conflicts. Mm -hmm. So that could be one explanation for it the cleric turns on their own god and in order to facilitate some um kind of movement or some kind of change in the balance another deity might step in and grant that 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 former cleric of whichever deity it was um gifts in and then obviously if you the more followers you turn to your faith the stronger that deity becomes so mm -hmm. that could be an explanation for it but yeah i okay. mean from a for, but that's just 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 a hypothetical, and no one no one really knows the ins and outs of it. But it, I see what you're saying from a from a from the only evidence we have is the cleric and the deity in conflict. It should be a case of take the powers, job done. What are you going to do now? Literally, like okay, you may have a boon or two that, or you might keep a cantrip or two, but or even a spell, but. Not, mm. neither, none of those will help you against her god like and, and also you get that was actually a good idea also making a cult 
with your god in mind, making him more powerful, which in turn can make you more powerful, and so on and so forth. So that was actually a good idea. Hmm. But again, again, another interesting question is um, reincarnate because uh, which, yeah, go on. because um, Ray's dead, obviously necromancy, but reincarnate is a transmutation. But you, yeah. it, it still, you still need to, you still need to call the soul back. You still need to put the soul into the into the, a, a new body, so to speak. Even, I. Sorry. Well, because the the reincarnation is creating a, a different body or potentially different body, but you still have to have that that crossover between the schools of magic, where you have, say to pull the soul back now that i would consider to be purely um necromantic you know that 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 taking of the soul and and pushing it back into a new body yeah that's the most perceived way of necromancy that most people see it as like Mm. genuinely i find it to be more manipulation like if you you're using the your arcane strings your arcane mana whatever your medium is whatever your um Spell casting focuses. You're you're using your arcane energy to manipulate the physical body with your magic. Yeah, like there's not that much soul man- soul manipulation in necromancy as much as people like to think. Well, no, I mean, like I said before, I mean there is, um, I mean one of my favorite supplements for D and D is uh, Encyclopedia Arcane Necromancy. It's purely dedicated to, to necromancy and nothing else uh, but it's for third edition but it still has some very good ideas and what they suggest in that is that necromancy is purely uh, the focus the focusing and the directing of negative energy and mm-hmm. I think people tend to look at necromancy as just a school of evil where what they're trying to suggest to you is that necromancy is a school of focusing and it's, it's just Taking an element, taking yeah. an energy, and just focusing it. I understand. I agree with you because you don't have to be bad to feel negative and use that negative emotion. Like good people feel negative all the time. Sure. Yeah, like I, I've seen paladins kill people out of rage. I have. Yeah, yeah. So, well, so well, like, but then again, the other argument there is not all paladins. Not all paladins are good, but I think I know where you're coming from. Oh, no, yeah, I know what you mean. This, this wasn't even an outbreaker. This was the most loyalist paladin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I know, yeah. But um, it's one of those things that just... You can see a paladin kill someone, right? Yeah. And you'll see a necromancer help someone. Mm-hmm. The necromancer would still be looked at as what's his intention. You know what I mean? Yeah, I see instead what you mean. Of, instead of getting like, oh, you know, he helped someone. That's that's cool of him. He would have gone. Uh, what's he doing now? Well, I think part of the perception is that um, if you ever saw, I think it was Pirates of the Caribbean, and uh, he rescues the girl, and she's like, "Oh, but he saved me." And the the arresting officer's uh, argument is, uh, "One good act is not enough to redeem a man of a, a lifetime of wickedness." Now, I mean, personally, I don't. I would I would not judge a person by the mistakes of the past, but then again, that's we're talking in the far past. I mean, if someone yeah. does something evil that right now and then does something good immediately afterwards, that's not quite the same thing. Yeah, but, I know, I get. You. But um, but there's still that's probably still I understand exactly what you're saying. They look at the necromancer and say, "Why did he do that good thing?" There's probably an underlying reason behind it. Um, but I mean, again, not every necromancer is necessarily evil or even behaves in evil in, ev- in an evil way. It's just the perception of their art as well. So I was playing a game on the old Xbox, and I can't remember exactly what it was called, but it was I can't remember the subtitle for it. But you have this character who joins your party, and he's a necromancer, and he's just like this cheerful. Um, happy like teenage young fellow and it's and it gives you this perception of oh it it's just it's just the art that I follow 
which is another reason why I say perhaps people get into the art because it's something that they're simply the most adept with. Yeah. I, I always think that um, there's the potential where you could you could simply roll uh, a dice before character generation, and you can then correspond whatever you roll to a particular school, and you could just write into your background that they are the most adept with that school. Hence, they go by the name, or they choose the arcane tradition of whichever. And if it falls on necromancy, so be it. Exactly. And another thing is, um, with the negative energy we're talking about, is that, as I was saying, our paladin kill someone that's negative energy. Negative energy is the same as good energy. Is it's there? Like it's not good nor evil per se. No, it, it exists in the world because everything needs to exist in balance. Exactly. I mean, you can't have good or evil, evil or good, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if you were to... If if there was no negative energy in a target or in a character or in any living thing in the world and you just it was just flooded with positive energy, it would be just as harmful. You you require the, the negative energy. There's a small... There's, again, a, a theory that there's a small amount of it in any living creature. It's the, the theory of entropy, why things age and decay over time. Exactly. But, but um, without that, without that buffer, you know, if, if, without that um, counterbalance, if you will, um, it would just be a, a flood of positive energy, and the things would, well, they just wouldn't survive. So, this is why things only survive for so long, is because there's always that piece of negative energy that's chipping away. But conversely. If it was just purely positive energy, there'd be no life anyway. No, so it won't be. It's it's a funda- It's one of the fundamental building blocks of everything. I, think, I like to think of it as kind of the, oh, I swear to God, I sorry if you get religious fanatics in your comment now, but it's like the <laughs> garden, a mortal life, but no death. Look where I that ended it up. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very very true. Um, but no, I don't necessarily think that. Um, it's something that's evil i think it's i think it's simply a, a lack of information um but then again it's going to be a trope that happens in every game because you're not going your your necromancer will sit there and they will delve into their arcane secrets and they will learn that necromancy is the purest uh, expression of focusing and directing negative energy and that it's essentially that's what the whole school boils down to but no no farmhand with a pitchfork is going to take the time to jump into a library and start you know reading that they're too busy tending the flocks or you know raking the raking the fields or whatever i was about to say like genuinely most of the time necromancers are keeping to their own business they're not actually bothering many people of course like, not. The, like the, the, the common necromancer is actually not bothering anyone he's no. literally you know, get better at his magic. Oh, for sure. I mean, they spend all their time um, in study, just like any other wizard does. Like, genuinely. And it's actually probably harder for a necromancer because it's been shown now. It's a hard school to actually, you know, get a group with than any other, in my opinion, because, you know, with fire, um, you can equate that to anything. You equate that to real fire, manipulating that, your inner rage calling out by that your god giving you the fire but with necromancy there's only a few aspects that you can really use it with to get it right the thing is and i'm, I'm talking from the wizard's perspective because uh, i tend to play the necromancer wizard character the way i look at it is we we work with what we're given and that's all we do we work with what we're given so it's a case of there's a body it becomes a tool um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, and if you're using curses, it, again, the energy is already present within the creature that you want to affect. It's just where you you move it and manipulate it and push it to. It's not like something like evocation, which creates energy. Ev- evocation has this uh, ability where it just makes energy. Hence, fireballs come out of nowhere. Yeah, no, evocation is completely different. It's more of an outcast magic more than in cast magic, I guess you can say, because you're it's an attunement type, because you're attuning into a body. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's a very good way of putting it. Magic. 
that's a very good way of putting it so where, but then again you know transmuters and necromancers they have the same mindset because they simply the transmuters mindset is um if life gives you lemons you know make orange juice or if it gives you orange you can make lemonade because <laughs> you you just take the thing and change it to to what you what you want to do or what you want to be yeah. Whereas the necromancer, even though they have a narrower scope, they still have the same, the same mindset of they go, they take what they've got and then they just put it purely into the areas where it's going to make the most effect. Yeah, they make the best out of what they got to their liking, or exactly. at least closer to their liking. Exactly. Uh, it also interests me is just like another school of magic that is actually I consider not more evil, just more creepy to be honest. Illusion. Why does no one talk about illusion? I think that's going to be a question for another day. Yeah, like because uh, comparative to necromancers, I think illusions are actually more evil and more creepy. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I would quite happily talk to you again and have this uh, a full discussion on illusion if you like. If you're up for it, I'll have to uh, study up on illusion, but I'll be up for it. But the thing about illusion is, well, they're... fear used to be necromancy back in the day. Now fear is based on illusion. Yeah. Um, but again, illusion very dark, very very dark, because you are. What it does is it taps into the creature's own personal um, experiences, and then it, it manipulates. Their, their worst nightmares there's no point in me p projecting an image into your mind and saying this is something that's going to terrify you if it's you know if uh, if you know you're not scared of dragons but you know yeah but then again if you feel scared of something like really ridiculous like fluffy bunnies yeah that and you someone creates the illusion of fluffy bunnies everywhere you're that's that's going to terrify you it'll keep reminding you of your fears and it'll psychologically damage you oh yeah and you just continue in this terrible like loop yeah, of... it's genuinely messed up. Like I, I don't know. I genuinely think illusion is hands down way more disturbing than necromancy can ever be. I think you've got there's a lot of potential there, and I'm, I'm absolutely up for having the illusion discussion. Although I think we do need to branch out on yeah. the, the necromancy yeah. a bit more uh, at a later date as well. Right. Yeah, hundred percent. Great. Well, I think we've covered a fair bit today. We had a, a good bit of story there of, um, of um, you know, your bank heist. I really enjoyed. Uh, we've gone into the, the necromancy a little bit. Um, I really enjoyed it. I would definitely would definitely like to have a conversation on it again. Perfect, because we need to actually talk a bit more in depth. But when that happens, it'll be a really good discussion. Sure, sure. All right. Um, well, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for having me, man. Not a problem. Um, you know, it's been a really great discussion. I'm going to put this up, um, and I would talk to you about it again any time. Yeah, you too, my man. Let me know when next time you want to do it, yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, you, you, you'll you be able to find me in the comments section, so... It'll do. Keep <laughs> my scope. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, definitely I will. I will. Bye, man. Thanks very much. Once again, thanks very much again to Live and Let Die 423 for coming onto the channel and sharing his experiences with different schools of magic and as well as giving that incredible story about that meticulously planned bank heist. It was really fun. I really enjoy sharing different ideas and different theories about things like this and it's just so good to have another perspective and being able to bounce ideas back and forward and I'm really looking forward to speaking with him again particularly about the illusion question. I'm also looking forward to talking with other people as well, discussing ideas and sharing them for the benefit of all the viewers as well. So if there are any other people who are interested in having a chat directly with me and putting it up as a video for everyone else to see, then let me know in the comments section and we'll try and work something out. And with all that being said, I will see you guys next time at the gaming table.